The mysterious disappearance of Amelia Earhart has both fascinated and haunted American mythos since the moment communication was lost to her Lockheed Electra 10 aircraft. Over the years, theory after theory has attempted to explain what happened that fateful day. However, since neither the wreckage of the plane nor the bodies of Amelia and navigator Fred Noonan have ever been recovered, these theories will remain as such for the foreseeable future. Today, we're going to examine the life of Amelia, as well as her untimely death, and end with some of the explanations that have been put forth as to what happened during her final flight. Amelia Earhart was born in Atchison, Kansas on July 24, 1897. Her mother's side of the family was quite wealthy, as her maternal grandfather was a former federal judge and president of a local savings bank. Her father was an alcoholic, though, and couldn't hold down a job which left Amelia, her mother, and sister relying primarily on her grandparents for food and housing as well as the two girls schooling. When both of her grandparents passed away within the span of a few years in the early 1910s, it was revealed they had placed all the inheritance left to her mother in a trust so her father couldn't access it, and had ordered the house and the rest of their possessions sold at auction. Her family moved to St. Paul, Minnesota, where her father had gotten a job with a railroad company, but he would eventually lose this job due to his inability to lay off the booze. The family continued to bounce around as her father juggled through jobs, and Amelia would eventually move to Chicago with her sister and mother to stay with friends while her father continued to struggle to provide for them financially. It was here she would spend the bulk of her teenage years. Throughout her childhood, she'd always shown signs of the tenacious adventurer she'd become, often exploring all around the neighborhood with her sister, climbing trees, and just getting into anything she could. You might think this was the start of some big love affair with flying, but reportedly Amelia's very first encounter with a plane at the 1908 Iowa State Fair resulted in her just kind of scoffing at it and asking to go back to the merry-go-round. Throughout grade school, she was always considered a tomboy and showed a much greater interest in science than other fields of study girls her age were more typically interested in. The idea of growing up to be a housewife was never something she thought highly of, and she began to grow an admiration for the small group of women who struck out on careers of their own rather than stay at home. So she knew she wanted to join them and become a career woman herself, but she wasn't quite sure what she wanted to do yet. Her answer would come in 1917 when a 20-year-old Amelia volunteered at a veteran's hospital in Toronto preparing meals for wounded soldiers returning from Europe during the First World War. Here, she spoke with pilots who regaled her with stories of missions they had flown over the Western Front. Amelia would stay here for several years and even became a patient herself at one point during the Spanish flu pandemic. Earhart would be fortunate to survive, but she would suffer from severe sinus issues the rest of her life. This caused her to suffer from sinus infections, and remember, we're talking pre-antibiotics here, so her only recourse was often to have painful and invasive procedures in an attempt to flush the sinuses out manually. Her passion for aviation would be solidified in 1919 when she saw an air show at the Canadian National Expo and decided her true calling lay in the skies. By 1921, she had saved up enough money to get her first flying lessons, which she received from an accomplished female pilot named Nita Southern. Southern was everything Amelia wanted to be, and the two would go on to become best friends. By 1922, she had purchased her first plane, a Kenner Airster that you can see here in a picture of Amelia and Nita. She was able to buy it using some of her inheritance money, as well as money she had saved working odd jobs. Earhart had truly found her passion, but the grim realities of life would soon rear their ugly head once more. In what I'm sure will be a shocking fact to many, buying and maintaining airplanes can get a little expensive. So while it was amazing for Earhart that she had found what she was meant to do, she had the unfortunate luck of it being quite literally one of the most expensive hobbies someone could have. A combination of poor money management and failed business ventures resulted in her being very strapped for cash by 1924. And to add more turmoil on top of it, her parents would end up filing for divorce the same year. Now in her late 20s, Amelia moved to Boston, Massachusetts, where she tried to enroll back in college, 
but was unable to afford it as the family inheritance had trickled down to almost nothing. She took a job as a teacher and maintained an interest in aviation, even working on the side as a sales rep for Kenner Aircrafts. Later, she would write articles covering aviation stories in a local newspaper and became vice president of the Boston Aeronautical Society. So she managed to turn things around for herself pretty quickly in a short period of time. When Charles Lindbergh became the first solo pilot to cross the Atlantic in 1927, it captured the world's attention, but had an even more exceptional effect on the aviation community. Pilots around the globe were itching to follow in Lindbergh's footsteps, and Amelia was no exception. She soon became involved in financing a project to do so, but initially was hesitant after reflecting on the potential danger involved with the trip. As fate would have it though, she would be offered a chance to take part in a transatlantic flight in 1928, not as a pilot, but as the esteemed position of flight log recorder. Boring job or not, her adventurous spirit wouldn't let her say no. One of the trip's financiers was a publicist named George Putnam. The two would soon become involved romantically, and Putnam would eventually leave his wife for Amelia. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. On June 17, 1928, Amelia and two others, which included pilot Wilmer Stoltz, took off from Newfoundland, New, Newfoundland, real creative name there, Canada, and landed in Wales 20 hours later where they were greeted by a massive crowd of supporters. At this point, transatlantic flights were still new enough that people were intrigued by each and every one. And with this flight, Amelia technically became the first woman to cross the Atlantic in an airplane despite not having actually piloted the aircraft herself. And this was a huge story at the time. Some news publications would go so far as to dub her the Queen of the Skies, despite her constantly deflecting the praise and insisting that Stoltz was the one who deserved the credit. All the attention she received from this really made her uncomfortable, and a large part of what would drive her solo flight across the Atlantic four years later was a determination to prove to the world, and more importantly herself, she was deserving of all this recognition. Earhart and Putnam became romantically involved soon after her return home and would eventually marry in 1931. While Amelia herself might not have been a huge fan of all the media attention, Putnam realized its potential to support her aviation dreams and make a lot of money for both of them. The two's relationship was less out of love and more out of a mutually beneficial business arrangement. Amelia did the plain stuff and George took care of all that icky PR stuff she didn't like to deal with. The two never had kids, Amelia didn't change her last name when they were married, and she would straight up refer to it as a partnership rather than a relationship. So friends with benefits, let's share a house and I'll pay you to be my agent. Over the next several years, Amelia would work hard to hone her skills as a pilot while George honed the Amelia Earhart brand. As an aviator, she made great strides, flying across North America and back in 1929, becoming the first woman to do so, and participating in competitive air shows. Putnam got her involved in several endorsement deals and business ventures, such as a clothing line with Macy's and a deal with Beechnut Chewing Gum, where she even flew a plane with their name on it. As I said, aviation was expensive and you needed to have money. Amelia particularly needed money because she was planning on a transatlantic flight of her very own. In 1932, she set out to do just that, flying from the stupid name Newfoundland and landing in Northern Ireland 15 hours later, becoming the first female pilot to cross the Atlantic on her own. The flight had been anything but smooth, as Earhart encountered several mechanical issues along the way and was even flying practically blind at one point due to heavy cloud cover and malfunctioning instruments. Despite this, she managed to make it to her destination and finally proved to herself she was deserving of her reputation. She was again celebrated across the United States, further solidifying her status as a national icon. She was even invited to the White House to meet the president, which was Herbert Hoover at the time, so meh. But she would end up developing a close friendship with a much better president when FDR was sworn in the next year. Particularly his wife Eleanor, who, like Amelia, was passionate about opening more doors for women in the United States. 
Mrs. Roosevelt would be a close friend of Earhart for the rest of her life. Upon returning home, she continued her work with trying to get women involved in aviation. Before her 1932 flight, she founded a group called the 99s, which was designed to support female pilots and women looking to get involved with aviation. Amelia was a charter member and served as its president from 1930 to 1933, and the organization still exists today. She would complete other solo flights, such as a flight from Oakland to Hawaii and back, but nothing that had made the splash that her transatlantic flight had. She knew there was only one barrier left for her to cross, and that was a flight around the world. The first flight around the world had actually taken place all the way back in 1924, when a team of eight men, four pilots and four navigators from the US Army Air Service completed the journey in 175 days. This was a meticulously planned operation that had the full backing of the US military and its even then gargantuan budget. Suffice to say, Amelia would need every dollar she could muster to make this happen and she would also need the most cutting-edge airplane she could afford. She spent several years securing funding and used some of the money to commission a custom plane from Lockheed Martin, a modified version of their Electra 10 aircraft that was designed with the most advanced radio and navigational equipment money could buy. But make no mistake about it, although her plane was absolutely top of the line, it was top of the line for 1937. What Amelia was attempting to do was extraordinarily difficult, and she would be pushing the technology in her aircraft to its limit, and as we'll see, tech problems would become a running theme from the very start of things. She decided to enlist the help of a navigator, since trying to make the flight alone would be borderline impossible. To this end, she recruited Fred Noonan after he was recommended by a colleague. In March of 1937, she attempted the first leg of the flight, going east to west from California to Hawaii. She took off with Noonan and a stunt pilot named Paul Mance, who she'd been getting flying lessons from for the last couple of years. The journey had been relatively smooth. When they attempted to take back off, there was a catastrophic malfunction. Whether this was human or mechanical error has been disputed, but the result was the wheels and landing gear completely collapsed as Amelia was going down the runway causing the plane to skid along its stomach and sustain heavy damage, resulting in the entire attempt being called off. Less than three months later, the plane was back in action and Amelia was ready to try again. Only this time, Mance, who believed the botched takeoff to be Amelia's fault, declined to join them. This time, it would just be Earhart and Noonan. This would prove to be a problem, as with Amelia flying and Noonan navigating, there wouldn't be a designated radio operator something that would become an issue later on. For this second flight, they would go west to east. Earhart and Noonan took off from Oakland, California in May of 1937 and landed in Miami, Florida just before June. They left Miami on June 1st, 1937 to begin the aerial marathon, and things were rocky from the start. They were delayed at one stop because of a monsoon and dealt with multiple mechanical issues. Despite this, they made it all the way to New Guinea by the end of the month. However, the final section of their return would prove the most difficult. The Pacific Ocean is gargantuan, and there really aren't a lot of spaces to stop and refuel. Earhart and Noonan would need to make carefully planned stops, island hopping through the Pacific to refuel until they made it to within flying distance of Hawaii. To this end, she would be offered the assistance of the US Coast Guard, who sent several vessels to meet her at these refueling spots and radio guidance to her plane. On July 2, 1937, Earhart and Noonan took off from Leigh Airfield in New Guinea, headed for a small uninhabited rock named Howland Island. This was considered one of the easier parts of the final stretch as Noonan was relatively close and Amelia would have multiple US Coast Guard vessels waiting for her by the island, along with hourly communication from a radio operator in New Guinea. Problems started almost immediately, though. Earhart was going against a strong wind, which made her burn fuel at a much faster rate than anticipated. The wind also seemed to cause radio interference, as the operator in New Guinea lost contact with her for several hours. When she did radio back, her message came through broken, 
but Amelia could clearly be heard saying they were losing fuel. There is also strong evidence to believe Noonan's nautical maps of the Pacific Ocean were inaccurate, possibly taking the flight off course. How close she and Noonan got to Howland Island is not known, but one can infer they weren't very far as the Coast Guard vessel USG Itasca received a radio call from Amelia at 7.42 am stating she was running low on fuel and asking for their location. The radio operator tried to answer, but Earhart wasn't able to hear him due to issues with the radio transmission. The Coast Guard then tried to send her directions in Morse code, which neither her nor Noonan could understand. The transmission had come in so clear, the Itasca's commanding officer actually went out onto the ship deck to try and flag her down, believing her to be very close. After that, though, the ship lost contact with her plane, and when the Coast Guard realized she was missing, a massive search was authorized by President FDR involving the Coast Guard and the Navy. As we all know, though, Earhart and Noonan were never seen again after taking off from New Guinea. Theories as to what happened to the two of them have ranged wildly, and before we wrap up this video, I just want to give a brief overview of a few of the most popular, in order of which, in my opinion, is most likely to least likely. Number 1. She ran out of fuel and crashed into the Pacific Ocean Definitely the most boring and straightforward answer, as it feels like such a mundane way for such an adventurous soul to go out, but there is good reason to believe this is what happened based on what we've already seen. Number 2. They crashed and landed on a desert island and starved This is certainly the most grim outcome. Many believe that when they realized they weren't going to make it, they attempted to divert the flight and crash landed on nearby Gardner Island, where her and Noonan tried to radio for help, couldn't find any, and eventually succumbed to the conditions on the island. With many claiming to have heard distress calls from Amelia, pointing to a wreckage located just off the coast of Gardner. Later searches found a skeleton on the island that was initially identified as a small European man. However, subsequent reviews argued that it could be the skeleton of a larger woman, which the 5'7 Earhart certainly was. They were planning to do a DNA test on the bones in 2019, but I can't seem to find anything concrete about results except for this one blog that claims a Science Channel TV special revealed it wasn't a match, which, if true, kind of puts this theory to bed, and honestly, for Noonan and Earhart's sake, I hope their fate was much quicker. And lastly, number 3. They were executed by the Japanese for being suspected American spies. And here is where we start getting into fan fiction. Japan and the United States definitely didn't have a great relationship at the time, but we were still a bit away from executing captured Americans. Plus, there is just no evidence to support this at all. After the Second World War, the Japanese were pretty open with the United States about the atrocities committed on some captured Americans and American POWs. If this had actually happened, there is no reason to think the Japanese wouldn't have recorded this somewhere, with the Americans finding it a decade later after the war was over. So, this one almost certainly didn't happen. Earhart and Noonan would be declared dead almost two years later, and to this day, no one knows exactly what happened during that fateful flight. One thing is for certain, though. The legacy of adventure and pioneering spirit that Amelia displayed throughout her life will serve as an example for generations of women and Americans to come. Thanks for watching.